Welcome to Dateline Health. This is Fred Lipman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. Uh, you know, uh, this show is your show. Uh, we try to get uh, answers to a lot of questions that come to us either by email or uh, by phone call or whatever. And uh, we've had a lot of interest in the issue of uh, HPV. The title of the show is What You Need to Know about HPV and oral cancer screening and treatments. So let me first introduce Dr. Sean McClure, who is a dental practitioner and also an MD. He's the associate professor and chairman of, and residency program director, which means an awful lot to us here at uh, Nova Southeastern, but what we'll get from him will mean an awful lot to you. So welcome, Dr. McClure. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Littman. Thank you for having me, and thank you for presenting this very important topic uh, for the community. Uh, unless uh, the layperson out there really doesn't know how the human papillomavirus can affect them and their oral health. So because from now on, we're going to say HPV, but uh, we'll have a nice discussion, and hopefully we can uh, help the community. I want to uh, first introduce... Uh your colleague, uh, uh, Anastasia uh, Quimby, uh, also a doctor of dental surgery and a, uh, an MD, and uh, she's going to talk about uh, maxillofacial surgeon, uh, uh, surgery eventually. But uh, welcome, Dr. Quimby. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Lipman. It's an honor. Thank you. You usually are involved with the uh, the effects and the uh, the uh, I guess you could say the the literal uh, application of destruction or otherwise of the oral cavity and I guess beyond uh, relative to oral cancer and uh, HPV. So we want to get into that a bit because the people out here are very interested. I think it's a very worthy topic of discussion. Um, absolutely. Well, you want to talk a bit about it? Sure. Um, so um, HPV or human papillomavirus um, is a probably one of the most common viruses that um, any one of us can encounter. Um, there is about over 100 variations of them. Um, the only ones that we particularly um, pay attention to and care about that relate specifically um, to the development of um, oral, specifically oral pharyngeal cancer, are only two types, um, type 16 and 18, for those of us who want to remember that. Um, but um, so out of hundreds of types of HPV, only two are the ones that have potential or have been linked um, to development of oral pharyngeal carcinoma. Um, and when we think of um, oral cancer or head and neck cancer, um, we tend to divide it in three different areas. Um, so the tongue and everything in front of the mouth, um, just kind of the area surrounding the teeth and the cheeks and the lips, that's traditionally described as oral cancer. Um, the role that HPV plays is more in the development of quote unquote oropharyngeal cancer. And that's the specific area in the back of the mouth that involves the tonsils um, that most kids get removed when they're young because of the recurrent tonsillitis. But those of us who keep, get to keep them may develop other issues there down the line, um, as well as the area that we call soft palate or that soft kind of um, area that's in the back of your throat, um, the back of the throat wall and the most back part of the tongue or that we call it the posterior one third of the tongue. So um, today's discussion is really gonna be focused mo mostly on that area in the back of the mouth or at the beginning of our throat um, that is susceptible to development, a development of um, cancer that's associated with HPV. Dr. McClure, uh, uh, again, you know, like I say, a lot of these, these questions come from viewers and uh, they, they, they see so much referral to HPV uh, through television broadcasts and television advertising. Uh, so uh, let's talk about uh, wh where does it come from? Uh, wh wh you know, how, what's the cause and effect? You want to add some knowledge to that area, Dr. McClure? Sure, Dr. Littman. Uh, the HPV virus, or the human papillomavirus, is a DNA, DNA type virus. It's a, as Dr. Primi says, it's very common. 
Uh, we've all encountered it uh, throughout our travels. Your viewers may know the human papillomavirus is more associated with uh, cerebral cancer uh, and anal cancer. Uh, so it's usually a sexually transmitted type of uh, disease. Now, as Dr. Quimby says, the human papillomavirus of many types, we're usually concerned with, with 16 and 18. Now, I wanna say about 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we had, we saw an increasing population of young people getting oral cancer. Now these younger people did not smoke, did not drink, they didn't have the same risk factors as normally associated with oral and oral pharyngeal cancer. So consequently, these patients weren't doing as well. Uh, physicians and surgeons thought because they didn't smoke or drink, they can do a minimal type of surgery and the patient should be fine. But unfortunately, they weren't. So they had to do a little bit of research. And within their research, they were discovering the HPV virus. Now, as you know, in America, we have an aggressive anti-smoking campaign. Yet these younger and younger patients were getting diagnosed with cancer. So they weren't sure if it was strictly HPV back then. But now in the last decade, they have confirmed that the HPV virus can cause these oral pharyngeal cancers and uh, oral cancer. Now, at one time in our life, we've all been infected with HPV. It's, it's not, it gets a bad rap, meaning it's through a sexual transmission, it's not. You can pick up the HPV virus from kissing Aunt Gladys on the cheek uh, on Thanksgiving. So it's, it has somewhat of a stigma attached to it. You just hit on the, the most important question that came to us. Uh, because uh, it is uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it can be picked up, like you just said. You could be having a Thanksgiving dinner, and all of a sudden, you're, you're, you, you, uh, three months later, you're seeing, or six months later, you're going to see your doctor, or you have some manifestation of problems, uh, swallowing or whatever, and they can't figure out what's going on. Uh, yes, Dr. Lemina, I do want to say, in the College of Dental Medicine, do teach uh, about oral cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer. But I'm going to disagree with you on one notion. Overall, oral cancer is relatively rare uh, among, uh, among all the cancers. So a lot of physicians, even ENT, in my experience, and even some oral maxillofacial surgeons can miss it, especially when a patient's younger and they don't smoke and they don't drink. They don't suspect it. So they do miss a lot of uh, tumors. We unfortunately diagnose a majority of these HPV cases, especially in the oral pharyngeal area, where it's very hard to see, by metastatic disease to the neck. Now, oral cancer metastasizes in a relatively defined fashion, but it's not like melanoma, it's not like breast cancer, which can go anywhere at any given time. Metastasize first to the cervical lymph nodes in your neck, and you feel like a hard bump, it's not painful. And that's when the majority of these oral pharyngeal cancers caused by HPV are diagnosed. Once the cancer is metastasized, unfortunately, it's increasing stage of cancer at its diagnosis. And the patient has to undergo so much more treatment. Uh, so we do, although the, the healthcare community is aware of it, I find that they lack in suspecting it and these younger patients with no risk factors. So now we have uh, Dr. Quimby. Uh, someone is referred to you and your subspecialty. Uh, what is the most, uh, well, what, 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 act, what action do you take? Um, what actions do I, do I take if I have a patient referred to me for evaluation of oral pharyngeal cancer? It was referred to you by uh, uh, one of uh, Dr. McClure's uh, fine people, one of the, whether it be uh, the uh, licensed dentist or resident, et cetera, et cetera. They get to you. Now, now what? what, what do you, how do you uh, uh, re review the case, tell the patient this is where we're going and what do you do? 
Yeah. So um, most important is, of course, collecting patient history. And as um, Dr. McClure already mentioned, you know, these are not the easiest tumors to pick up on. Um, the reason being is because they're um, sometimes, unlike the classic um, head and eye cancer, they, we can't really even see the um, initial area where the tumor started because it may be hidden somewhere within the tonsil, tonsillar crypt or somewhere within um, kind of the wrinkly surface of the back of the tongue where you can't really perceive it at all. Um, but do pa patients do present with a lump in the neck and then um, that warrants an investigation. So I think um, when I see a patient, um, I would, you know, we would have a discussion about when did they first start experiencing um, or noticing any changes um, or any differences in presence of lumps in their neck. Um, if they have ever had a, a prolonged sore throat. Um, so somebody comes in and, you know, and they're over age of 35, uh, because most of the times, the like Dr. McClure already mentioned, uh, these types of tumors they affect actually a younger population that is that doesn't really quite match the criteria for the typical head and neck cancer. So they're non-smokers and non-drinkers. They're younger and they present with a potentially a prolonged sore throat or earache. Um, so if somebody who had sore throat for several weeks um, is over age of 35 or also complains of like an earache um, of some sort or um, feels a lump in their neck. Um, we would, that would certainly warrant a conversation about when they first noticed those symptoms. Um, once we have a discussion about that, the next step is, is to perform appropriate evaluation. And that involves um, using a small camera that we pass through the nose um, and evaluate kind of the tissues in the back of the throat, because as you can imagine, not very accessible on a regular exam. So if we can just going to take a look, you know, open, have somebody open their mouth and take a look, we won't really see much. So we need um, some assistance. And usually we use um, cameras. Um, so it's called um, nasopharyngoscopy, as well as sometimes we actually take patients to the operating room where we can um, do an in-depth exam of all of the posterior, kind of the back of the deep of the throat, um, areas with cameras and good lighting so we can look and search for those areas. Um, in the event that we don't really see anything that could potentially be presenting as a cancerous tumor, um, um, the latest uh, national cancer guidelines recommendations also um, recommend just doing almost like a prophylactic sampling of areas that where we know that most likely those tumors may be hiding. So on um, like the tonsils or the back of the tongue base, uh, we just kind of take several samples and send them off to biopsy to see if the tumor is so small that we can't really see it with our eyes, but somebody under the microscope can actually appreciate some changes in the cells uh, and then tell us whether they found any tumor cells so then it can direct our treatment. Um, so after we've collected the history, did our exam, um, and hopefully identified the area where the tumor is coming from, then we talk about um, different treatment, treatment options. And uh, for any head and neck cancer, we have options that involve surgery, uh, radiation, and chemotherapy. With oropharyngeal cancer in particular, um, it was found that it does respond well to radiation therapy most of the time, um, which is a bit of a beneficial news for the patient because they can bypass surgery and potentially get comparable results in um, overall outcomes and disease control. Um, not to say that radiation is harmless. There's, of course, risks and consequences associated with somebody going through radiation, um, but it is oftentimes a preferred option for someone who's diagnosed with um, oropharyngeal cancer just because surgery in that area is very tricky and also um, is very uncomfortable for the patient to recover from, um, especially when we're talking about tumors that may be a little larger. If we have an early stage tumor, um, we are thankfully um, due to the development of the newer technologies and whatnot, you know, we can do what's called transoral robotic surgery to address those small tumors that then don't really lead to as much, um, you know, morbidity or as much painful recovery for the patient after the surgery. Um, so all in all, the discussion would be had uh, with the patient as well as the patient would be presented at a multidisciplinary tumor board where you know, uh, we meet with radiologists, radiation oncologists, hematology oncology, and other subspecialties to um, discuss what would be the most suitable option for this patient. 
Dr. M Dr. McClure, let me uh, noticing the uh, or listening to uh, Dr. Quimby and and recognizing the the uh, very uh, astute and acute uh, manner in which uh, uh, this uh, oral cancer uh, surgical procedures are, even though with with all of the wonderment of what minimally invasive techniques that we use today, uh, how do we train our students uh, here at the, the dental college at Nova Southeastern University? How do do they do they start to learn in their third and fourth years uh, as they go go into the clinic environment, or do they uh, work? Uh, uh, only uh, later on uh, in their residency or years? Uh, it's a very good question, Dr. Littman. At the College of Dental Medicine, uh, for the students, we have a wonderful predoctoral uh, instructor. Uh, she's an oral max official surgeon, Dr. Anna Ospina. And I lecture the third year dental students about head and neck cancer. Also with my residents, uh, especially in a licensed dentist, they just kind of come in, see their patient, look at the teeth and send them home. But I try to train them to do a quick head and neck examination. They'll come in, feel the size of the neck, feel for any lumps or bumps, take a look around, especially in the, in the back of the mouth, as far as they can go, take a look at their cheeks, take a look at their palate, take a look at the floor of mouth and run your finger along the floor of the mouth. And actually, lastly, look at the tongue, gently pull the tongue out, look on the side to see if there's anything suspicious. It's an exam that takes less than 30 seconds and you could actually may pick something up on a, a patient. Because a lot of these cancers, you have to remember it, they are not painful when you're initiated. So patients and doctors, well, they have no pain, that, that means it can't be bad. Actually, that's false. So especially with Dr. Quimby was saying, these tumors in the oral pharyngeal area, there's no pain. And until they start feeling symptoms, a lump in their throat, having a hard time swallowing, having a hard time opening, the tumor is quite big by that time. And again, with no pain. So this quick head and neck examination that we instill upon the students and the residents at the College of Dental Medicine for NOVA is a key factor in help uh, preventing these diseases from getting larger and metastatic. You know, one of the questions that came to us from our viewers, uh, I think it was uh, someone who identified themselves as a retiree, so I would assume they're somewhere in their 60s or 70s, and they were talking about the, uh, the, the it was difficult to swallow. And it was not, not they couldn't swallow, it's just that they felt like the, the epiglottis, the area that protects the, uh, the the food from going down into your wind in quotes windpipe you know, or your esophagus. So uh, is that a suspect or is that is that suspectful? I mean, is that something that would be viewed by the dental practitioner? That's uh, probably a tumor around the epiglottis area. Again, it is uh, painless. It's having a restriction of the movement of the epiglottis to protect to protect the airway while swallowing. Uh, again, you have to have a high degree of suspicion. Uh, so if they went to the dental practitioner and saying, I'm having trouble swallowing or food keeps going down my windpipe, they should immediately refer to the primary care for more diagnostic tests, especially if they can't uh, see anything on their exam. Uh, this is not something that should be written off by the dental practitioner or the oral max official surgeon. So Dr. Quimby, uh, I... I uh... I'm switching over to you on the same issue, the same question. Uh, we have a situation where this, this viewer asked us this question. Uh, do, you, do you view it uh, visually or do, do you uh, enter it uh, with a, a camera focus? Or, well, how do you know whether that's in quotes a difficulty swallowing my epiglottis is, uh, is slow swollen. What, what would you do, Dr. Quimby? Yeah, so um, absolutely just kind of getting a little bit more history on it. And if it does, you know, if the patient sounds suspicious for if this was something that's been a longstanding issue, right? So if it just happened, um, might be a, like a 
not tumor etiology, but if it's something that has been going on, it's kind of over time start to get a little worse and worse. And especially if patient also complains of hoarseness of voice, um, then that certainly would warrant additional workup, like Dr. McClure said. And one of those things would be passing down the camera to evaluate everything um, with you know, visualization um, and then ordering additional images, CT scans, and other things that we have at our disposal um, to sort of ensure that we're not missing anything uh, because, you know, patients may have that complaint for a variety of reasons, um, but certainly ruling out a tumor uh, would be of utmost importance. The query came also with a sort of an addendum, and they said, do I have to have a biopsy? Absolutely. So um, the camera exam can often be done in office. So it's an easy sort of a quick thing that we can do uh, where we just evaluate a patient in office when they're awake. And then if on that examination, we see something that is suspicious, um, then the next stage would be to take patients to the operating room, put them to sleep, and then do sort of more of an in-depth look. And then at that time, um, if we confirmed our suspicion that there's something abnormal, we can obtain the biopsy samples and receive the information from a pathologist to whether there's tumor or not. Okay. Well, uh, I know this has been a very difficult subject area, and uh, I, we're down to the last two and a half minutes of the show, but I want to get quickly back to uh, Dr. McClure. Dr. McClure, uh, you being the, uh, the, the uh, chairman and program director of the residency program, but also uh, you come in contact with our third and fourth year students uh, who are going to be dental practitioners uh, without possibly residency going forward. Uh, are, we, are we giving them or are we requiring them to uh, meet some of the standards which you uh, very clearly brought to the uh, conversation? Uh, I believe so, uh, with their multiple lectures. And uh, I have seen the students on my own while walking through the halls of the dental school do head and neck examinations on their patients. Uh, so I think we are doing very well. And, and in a program like ours, like our oral maxillofacial surgery de department is, uh, we see a lot of cancer. Uh, so the patients, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the students know, uh, know about our program. And so the oral cancer is really pushed upon them during their lectures. And I think they get a good, good uh, experience. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. I know this is not uh, the typical subject area that we discuss, but, uh, you know, like I said, this program belongs to the viewers. If they ask the question, I got to try to bring some information to them. So I, I thank you both for not only your professional competence and your willingness to teach. Uh, you know, that's to me, that's, that's the blessing. Uh, giving edu uh, knowledge to other individuals is probably the most powerful thing that we can do uh, as, uh, I guess, one individual, one human being to another. So uh, Dr. McClure and Dr. Quimby, thank you for not only your professional work, but also your standards, which you uh, impart uh, upon the student population at Nova Southeastern University's College of Dental Medicine, uh, because it's so important. Uh, this, this is a, a, a sort of a, a non-communicative uh, subject matter, but it did come up. And if, like I said, if we, if we don't answer the questions of our viewers, we've been doing this now for well over 22 years, so somehow there are a lot of questions. And I, I, was, I was thinking about it, and I was saying, now how are we going to talk about this issue? But uh, I, I, to be candid, I did not know that we were, were able to assemble such a uh, uh, really wonderful uh, group, and you, Dr. McClure, and you, Dr. Quimby, to come forward to discuss the issues. So thank you very, very much. We appreciate your activities, not only professionally as uh, professional dental and medical providers, but more importantly to uh, me personally, is the knowledge that you uh, bring to the student population so they can carry on your, your dedication and your will to your profession. So thank you both for being here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for having us, Dr. Lerman. My suggestion to you, and I'm sure it's doubled up by Dr. McClure, 100% uh, that 
you can't let yourself go by without having your dental checkups. How many times a year, Dr. Uh, McClure? Uh, at least twice a year. Some people have to go four times a year. Oh, well, four times a year is four times a year. Uh, I, so if you do it two times a year, it's more than no times a year. But uh, I think it's important for you to, uh, people don't realize how important oral uh, care is, uh, not only relative to uh, uh, oral cancer, but other issues as well. And we will get to that at some other time. We thank you for uh, showing up. Remember, uh, this, this program is your program. And uh, if you have any questions or comments, there's an email address and a uh, telephone, whatever, communication opportunity for you is right here. And uh, as I always tell you, your health care is in your hands, so don't be silent. If something's bothering you, get to your doctor, get to your dentist, get to whoever is your health care provider. Tell them what's going on. Don't just walk into the dentist and say, oh, I've been goggling with something, it's, it's soothing and whatever. No, 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 no. Explain to them what's going on. Let them make the decisions. It's for your benefit. Remember, this program is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. My name is Fred Lipman. Until next time, see ya.